while you're resting on your feet, take a moment to pray, and then we'll jump right into the word. I think today's word will, it will bless you, because it blessed me. How I many of you know the cooks got to eat first, right? They sample it just a little bit. All right, so bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we've come to the part of the service where we get to taste and see that you are good. And so, Father, I pray that my preaching and teaching be not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of your power. I pray that they see all of you and none of me. I am humbled to be a vessel used to minister to your people. And so, Father, I pray that as the word goes forth, it won't return into your void, but it would accomplish all that you have sent for it to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Say hello to your neighbor and take a seat. All right. Our text today will be found in Numbers chapter 13. And we'll read a little bit of scripture. We're jumping down to Numbers 13 because in the, the chapter itself, it's um, we see the story of God giving instruction to Moses to the Israelites. And he's instructing him to tell them to go and spy out the land that he promised to them. And he's letting them know that when you get there, you'll get a chance to see what I have promised to you. And so when we jump down to verse 25, that's what we'll pick up. The spies have already went to the land. They've already spied it out. They confirmed in their hearts that it is flowing with milk and honey, and they brought some of the, the fruit thereof back for the Israelites to see. And 25 reads, and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Achan there, the Amalekites, Dwell in the land in the south, the Hittites and Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with them said, We are not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who we saw in it, men of great stature, there we saw the giants and the descendants of Achan came from the giants and we are like grasshoppers in our own sight. So we were in their sight. Here it is, you have a promise from the Lord. He says that I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. But he also told the people, not only am I going to give you this land, but I'm going to move out the people that are occupying the land. And so he was clear that there are some people there but we're, we're going to drive them out of the land, and, and I'm going to give it to you. But as we read this, we read the report that is, in my opinion, of a half-truth. They confirm that, yes, it does flow with milk and honey, 
But then they begin to say things like we are not able to overcome it. They're stronger than we are. We are like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so they begin to view things through a lens that was not what God had promised unto them. How many of you know that your words, they have power? The Bible tells us that life and death lies in the power of your tongue. And those that eat or say will eat the fruit thereof. And so you're going to eat what you say. Amen. And so maybe I should have named it that, but I didn't, I didn't call, I didn't title the message that today. But we, we're, we're, we're going to just go through this a bit because there are some things that I'm seeing. How many of you have ever received the promise from somebody, but then doubted that they were able to do it? How many of you have been told that I can assure you that this thing is going to happen, but somewhere within your heart, you weren't yet convinced of it. So the title of today's message is called Be Careful to Obey, Volume 2. It takes a mindset shift. A mindset shift. Today, my assignment is to remind you of the significance of being careful to obey. When I ministered on this previously, I focused a bit on the, the terms of the covenant that God had outlined. There were some promises that God had established with the Israelites. We looked at Leviticus 26, 1 through 9. We won't go there, but you'll read it in your chapters this week. But in the covenant, the God promised increase. He promised abundance. He promised protection. He promised them peace. God promised that they would be fruitful and multiply, that he would dwell among them in the promise of a new covenant. And so the covenant that he was looking to establish with the Israelites was like a generational thing. It was because somebody previously had established a covenant with the Lord and he was wanting to bless the next generation because of it. But when you read in Leviticus 26, it says, then I will, do, I will establish my covenant with you. So he's saying that if you do these things, if you follow the outline of what's in a covenant, I mean, in, the, in the, the terms of the covenant, I will go as far as to say, I'm going to give you all of these things, but then I want to establish a new covenant with you. Amen. And so in the book of Numbers, we read the story that's very familiar to us. God sends Israel to spy out the land. I believe that as we look through the story, like many others that preceded, we have many accounts of the Israelites vocalizing their dislike for the conditions that they were in. And so Numbers 13 is no different. They allowed their situation to determine how they would speak about it. And that, that's already an era. It would appear that when they cried out to God for help when they were in Egypt, they weren't interested in being rescued or free from their circumstances, but it was a cry for relief from their discomfort from, that they were experiencing for the moment. Here's a good example of that. I have a, a baby sister, and when we were younger, when she would get in trouble, she would cry and say that something hurt or that she had to go to the bathroom. And immediately, you know, my parents would, you know, throw their hands up. It was like, okay, well, go do what you have to do. Well, most times she would go and take care of whatever it is she needed to take care of, touch what was hurting and, you know, things of that nature. But this particular time, they told her you were in trouble. She was going to get a spanking. And they, they threw up their hands after she said, well, I really have to go to the bathroom and I have to go now. And they threw up their hands. She went and sat down in front of the TV. So she had no desire for the punishment that was coming, what she wanted was release, relief from what her circumstances had got her into. And so like many of us, we cry out to the Lord and we ask for help for certain things, but sometimes I don't think the help is what we're looking for. 
We want the pressures of what we're dealing with or what we're up under to be moved from over us. We're not ready to really do a, a 360 or 180 change from where we are. We just want the Lord to relieve the pressure. Amen. So it's kind of like walking out in this Texas heat. You know what's hot. You know what's coming. And, and you're like, well, I, I can't bear the heat. So what do you do? You go inside. You get cooled off for a bit. And when you need to go back out, you go back out. But nobody has ever asked the Lord, can you, can you take us out of these three-digit numbers? So I wonder if we're okay with the heat. Amen. And so you get what you ask for. And so I want to take a look at Numbers 14, verse 1 through 4. So the congregation, they lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the people, all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if we had only died in the land of Egypt, or if we had only died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fail, fall by the sword, that our wives and children become victims? Wouldn't it have been better to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select the leader and return to Egypt. Even after experiencing the miraculous wonders of the ten plagues, Seeing the Lord part the Red Sea, the Lord providing manna from heaven, the Lord purifying the bitter water to quench their thirst. He sent quail when they asked for meat. The Israelites somehow believed that life was better for them in a place of slavery, in a place of bondage, a place where they lacked freedom, where they were subject to harsh conditions than being with the Lord. We have to be careful when we say from our mouths that back in the day, things were so much better for me. Because that means you lose an appreciation for where God has brought you from to where he has you at now. Amen. Here we see that we allowed their temporary situation to change their expectation in God. He hasn't changed. Whenever things become too hard, they seem to forget who God is and instantly decide that it was better back where they were. Let me tell you something. God is the friend that comes through in the clutch. You have that friend, you're going through some things, and you can call them, and they'll drop everything that they have to ensure that you have what you need, right? He's the friend that you can depend on. He's closer than the brother. Amen. He's the friend that when he says a thing, it is truly going to come to pass. Amen. And so I would like to believe that the Israelites lacked faith. And you know that faith requires hearing and obeying God's voice. But I would submit to you, but you can't obey God if you don't recognize his voice. So even while the Israelites experienced the miraculous signs and wonders of God, somewhere along the line, their mindset about who God was had not shifted. They were in the midst of seeing plagues. The midst of seeing the, the Red Sea open, split in half. They were in the midst of seeing them drive out people before them. He's sending manna from heaven and ensuring that they got fed. He's having the leader speak to rocks and water come out. How many of you know that your eyes should be open to know that this God that is looking to love and care for me, he heard my cry when I asked to be rescued and he is coming through. Amen. He is doing everything that he promised, that he would supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. So they didn't go without a thing. They weren't short of anything. Yet, in the midst of a situation bringing about pressure, they got discouraged somehow. 
Amen. They they lost their focus. They lost their zeal. They lost their passion for the things of God. And I would like to believe that it 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 happened because they lacked faith. They didn't believe in the person that was able to bring them through. Amen. And so I would believe that they relegated God to being the person who paid for their food in the drive through window. Have you had that experience? You go through the drive through window on the person before you pay for you, and you like, cool, that was great. I ain't have to spend my money. Glory to God. He blessed. He came through today. And that's it. But each and every time pressures were brought about, there was, we were better off in Egypt. Would it have been better that we had died? At least we had food and we had plenty of where we were. But did you forget about the miracles that happened along the way? Did you forget about that when you cried out for hunger, he ensured that you had something to eat? Amen. And every time they opened their mouth to solicit help, he came through despite their complaints. They benefited from the miracle, but they had no relationship with the God who worked the miracle. God meets your faith at the level of your obedience. So if your level of faith is here, he's going to meet you right where you're willing to be obedient at. Amen. And so it requires great faith to follow after the things of God. Sometimes there is going to be pressures that are brought on. You're going to be discouraged. Things are going to happen. But in the midst of it all, we have to know that God is with us. And so in the terms of his covenant, he told them that I will be with you. Amen. And so today I'm here to challenge your thinking, ask you to think a little different than what you've experienced in the past. And so this week I've been meditating on Romans 12. And each time I've read it, the Holy Spirit has showed me something different that I hadn't seen before. And so today I just want to I want to give you three points that will aid in your, your shift or your mindset. I don't want you to leave thinking that the Lord left this letter in the Bible for us to just enjoy as leisure reading, but it's for our learning. It's so that we know to do things a little different. And so the Israelites is like some of us. Is. Sometimes we have forgotten what the Lord has done for us. We forgot that he has come through. We forgot that he supplied. We forgot that when we didn't have, he ensured that we did. We forgot about the miracle that he performed. We forgot about the increase that he allowed us to have. We forgot. And sometimes you have to be reminded that the Lord is still good. He still owns a cattle on a thousand hills. None of that has actually changed. But your mindset has to shift to know that God is still God. And irrespective of what my situation is, it is not going to change because of it. So you have to be sure, you have to be confident that the God you serve is going to fulfill every single promise that he has spoken to you. And so in the midst of looking at the covenant that God established with them, he did it because Abraham was faithful. He counted him as a friend. And everything that he commanded him to do, he did it. But he didn't start off that way. He had a shift in his mindset. And so even today, you have to have a shift in your mindset. You can't be thinking that I don't have when you have a God that owns it all. Amen. And so it starts with a shift in your mindset. You can't speak what you see. You have to speak by faith those things into existence. You have to speak those things that are not as though they were. Amen. And so a few years ago, I had somebody say to me, I didn't receive it at the time that they said it, but they said to me, and I'm going to say it to you, you just need to shut up, shut your mouth. 
just shut your mouth. Just shut up. I had spoken some things that I was not supposed to speak, and what came from there was you just need to shut up. You may see it that way. You may have heard it. You may have been privy to it. But sometimes you just need to shut up. And so point number one is talk less and listen more. You want to change your mindset? Shut up. The Bible says in Proverbs 17 and 28, even a fool, when he holds his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So you want to appear that you understand? You want to appear that you are wise? Shut up. That's the one thing the Israelites didn't do. We don't have water. Would that we have died back in Egypt. At least we could get water. We don't have meat. Would that we have just died in Egypt. At least we had the fatted calf. No appreciation for what God has done. The spies confirmed what God had promised, that the land did flow with milk and honey. However, they began to speak the fears over what God had promised. So shut up. Amen. Number two, renew your mind. Renew your mind. So after you stop talking and you begin to just hear on the side of your face, you have these two round things that were given to you at birth, right? And then he gave you one of these things. It's just one that's on your face. Oh, my gosh, just one. So that you can listen twice as much as you talk. That's what I tell my boys. If you listen more and talk less, you would hear what God is saying to you. And sometimes in the midst of being busy and being hurrying and thinking that when somebody says something, you have to have a quick comeback or you need to always have a response. Sometimes you don't need to say anything. So shut up. So number two, renew your mind. Romans 12 and 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, faith family church, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What I like about this is he's beseeching them by the mercy of God. It's not of themselves. And then he tells them, present yourself. So if you are aware of what happens in the Old Testament, when you present an offering, you had to make sure it was alive, that it was perfect, it was the right age, and it was without defect. Here it is. You get to present your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And when you do, you want to make sure that it's holy, that you've set yourself apart. You want to ensure that it's acceptable unto God. So you don't want to come in here giving him no anything. So if your attitude ain't right, you got time to get it together. Remember, you don't have to wait to worship to adjust your attitude. You can do it on the car ride home. You can have pre-worship before the worship. Amen. And the pre-worship starts to condition your mind to receive what God is about to plug into you. Amen. And so worship takes longer when your attitude hasn't been adjusted. Because you're standing there, you're looking like, why she wore that today? I don't, I don't know if I would have wore that. And why they singing this song? They sang it last week. That's not the one that I really like. And woo, him on that keyboard, he just, he ain't doing it right. Your focus is not where it needs to be. So he says, acceptable unto God. It's not for you to decide what's acceptable. He's already told you what's acceptable. Which is your reasonable service? When I look this up in a different translation, reasonable service says it's your worship. It's your worship. It is your worship that you're bringing. Verse number two says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your what? That ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so here it is, 
It's telling you don't conform to this world. The 1828 Western Dictionary defines conform that's made to resemble. Reduced or, yes, reduced to a likeness of. You're being reduced to the likeness of the world. Made agreeable to. Is that what you want your association to be? But the word transform says changed in form or external appearance, metaphor, 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 transmuted and renewed. That means there is a change that's happening on the inside out. So think of a caliputer that goes into a cocoon and the transformation happens. And when he comes out, he's this beautiful display of colors and things of that nature. But what I like about this verse is that it's telling you don't conform, but be transformed. And in the midst of your transforming, something happens, right? You come out being an example to the world that God's will is good, God's will is acceptable, and God's will is perfect. That's the point of transformation. God's will is proven to be good, acceptable, and perfect when we transform our minds. So we have to renew our minds. That's why the Bible tells us to do it daily. Number three, be willing and obedient. That's important. You can be willing to do something, but your heart or you may not be obedient fully to get it done. Because anytime you're given an instruction or asked to do it, there may be a willingness, but it's like, I won't do that but I may do this. But the Bible says be willing and obedient. Willing and obedient. Isaiah 1, 19 says that if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. There's blessing that comes when your heart is both willing and obedient. Amen. So number one, talk less and listen more. And remember, I hate to say it, but it says a fool. A fool, when, when he holds his peace, he's counted wise. Amen. Renew your mind is number two. So take a moment to allow God to have a transformation that starts in your mind. Because transformation happens from the inside out. Amen. And you'll prove to the world that God's will is not only just good, it's perfect. Amen. It's acceptable. Hallelujah. And then number three, be willing and obedient. Have a heart that's willing to chase after God despite what it looks like. I close with this. God meets your faith at your level of obedience. If you're taking notes, write that down. God meets your faith at your level of obedience. God meets your faith at your level of obedience. We may look at some people in our lives and we see that they are prospering. It seems that they're living a life that's much more plenteous and richer than what we are living. But could it be that they've been careful to obey the things of the Lord? that their lives have opened the door to favor with God that you have not even tapped into yet. Abraham's obedience was rewarded. In Genesis 26, I want to look at verses 16 through 18. And it says, By myself I have sworn, said the Lord, because thou hast done this thing, it has not withheld your son, thy only son. So here it is. We have a man who was once Abram, who didn't have any children. He didn't have an inheritance. He was not as rich as he was, but he had a promise from the Lord. He told him to go outside and look at the stars and that he was going to bless him to have a family that was as numerous of the stars, if he could count them. And then he took him to the beach and said, look at the sand. Can you count the sand? That's how numerous 
your family is going to be. And at the time, he didn't have what the Lord was assuring him he was going to have. But what he had was a promise. Many of you in this place today have a promise from the Lord. That you've been holding on for, it seems like forever. And every now and again, you get discouraged. You may go back and pick it up. I know the Lord promised this to me. But it don't look like it's coming to pass. So you put it back down and you walk away from it. But we have an example of somebody who had a promise. His wife couldn't bear children. It looked extremely hopeless for him. They came up with what they thought was a God idea, but it was their lack of faith in what God had promised to them. And so they came up with a solution that you sleep with her and we'll have the baby that we're looking for. And maybe this will be how the Lord blesses you. But the Lord said, no, I know what I said and I meant what I said and I'm not changing what I said. Irrespective of how it looks, I said it was going to come this way. So trust me to believe it's going to come this way. And so because of their lack of obedience to what he was telling them to do, they delayed the promise coming. So I want to tell you today, don't get distracted. Keep your eyes focused on what he already promised to you. Because rest assured, he's going to bring it to pass. He's going to meet you at your level of faith. But obedience has to come with it. You can't have faith without obedience. The two are synonymous. They work hand in hand. Because you can get a promise. But if you don't lack the faith and activate it with your obedience, then it's just the promise that you have. So I'm going to say to you today, we have an example of somebody who had a promise. He didn't have kids. It didn't look hopeful that he was going to have kids. According to the standards, he was too old to bear children. But the God said, not so. It's not based on what the world calls it to be. It's what he said. And he has the final say. So Genesis 22 and 17 says that in blessing, I will bless thee and in multiplying, I will multiply thee. Thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand, which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou has obeyed my voice are you willing to obey we see the story of Moses and Aaron that they didn't make it into the promised land because they failed to obey I trepidated if whether or not I wanted to end on on this because I figured we would need to end at a higher note but the Holy Spirit said put it in there if you know the story of Aaron and Moses they didn't make it into the promised land Numbers 20 and 12 says and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock and he said unto them here now ye rebels must we fetch you water out of this rock his attitude was wrong. He was willing to do what God told him to do, but he lacked obedience. And it says, and Moses lifted up his hand and with his rod, he smote the rock twice and the water came out abundantly and the congregation drank in their basic beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because you didn't believe me, because you didn't have faith in me, 
to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, ye shall not bring the congregation into the land which I have given them. Before Moses died, he took them to a mountain. And on that mountain, he told them to look over at the land that's flowing with milk and honey. I would hate to be in a place where the Lord has given me a promise. I've picked it up and I put it down. I picked it up and I put it down. And then he instructs me to do something. And then I decide, instead of speaking to my situation, that I will handle the matter in a different way. And he take me to the place where I can see the manifestation of what he promised to me, but I can enjoy it because that's what happens. Children of God, I just want to encourage you today, be careful to obey. Be careful to obey. Be careful to obey. Be careful to obey. I can tell you stories of where I've missed the mark, where I've said what I shouldn't have said, where I've gone where I shouldn't have gone, where I've been prompted by the Holy Spirit to say a thing and I've done something different. So I'm not speaking from a place that I don't understand, but I tell you wholeheartedly that the Lord's promises are rich and they are full. He desires to have a covenant with you. He desires to bring it to pass. He wants to ensure that you live in a place of abundance, but it starts with your obedience to his commands. Hallelujah. Stand up on your feet. God is so good. He's so merciful. He is so awesome. And he desires to have relationship with us. We miss the mark often. We don't do it the way he says to do it. And sometimes we don't say it the way he says it. I'll give you a few minutes, I'll pray. But then put on your heart that promise that the Lord has assured you of, whether it's been days, months, or years. Put it upon your heart. Get it before your eyes. And present it to the Lord. Lord, I'm coming back. I know you promised this to me. I know it don't look like it, but I'm trusting and believing that it's going to come to pass. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for your sovereignty, Lord, but most assuredly for your mercy and your grace today. You love us with an everlasting love. And so even when we miss it, Father, you give us grace, an opportunity to right our wrongs. And so, Father, we hold up before you that thing that you have promised unto us. We haven't forgotten about it, but we're bringing it before you, Lord, saying that I do believe, I do believe, God, that you're going to bring this thing to pass. I was discouraged. I allowed my situation to take my eyes off what you have promised unto me. But, Father, I'm bringing it back before you. I'm asking that you reignite the passion that I had, the longing, the desire to run hard after what you have for me in this lifetime. And so, Father, I'm bringing it before you and I'm picking it up and I'm saying, Father, I do believe I have faith. There's an assurance in my heart that you will bring it to pass in my generation. So, Father, forgive me. For when I've put it down, when I've laid it aside, when I spoke against it, Father, I'm asking, Father, that you clear my heart of the wrong in this matter and give me another opportunity to, by faith, take hold of this, take possession of it, and run hard after it in a life of obedience unto you. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Give the Lord some praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Isn't he good? Isn't he good? Isn't he good? God, you're so good. Hallelujah. Worthy of our best praise. Hallelujah. If you're in this place today and you just so happen to not know the Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to make him your Savior today. In Romans 5 and 12, it says, Wherefore, as one man sin entered into the world and by death, by sin, death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. But there was a solution that the Lord offered. John 3, 16 say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, and you're that whosoever, believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so the name of that solution was Jesus. Acts 4 and 12 says, There is neither salvation in any other way, for there is none other name under the heaven by which we can be saved. So in Romans 10, 8 and through 10, it says that, But what saith thee the word is not even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised them from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to repeat after me, even if you already are saved. We want to be a support to those that are making this decision one of the most important, greatest decisions of their lives. Father, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for me on the cross, bearing my sins for me. I believe that he has risen from the dead he is alive. Lord Jesus, I say with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. And I am right now born again. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pray that you all were blessed on today, that the Lord minister to your heart in a special way. I just want to encourage you guys, have a blessed, blessed week. And whatever that thing is that God promised to you, put it on a note card and put it on your mirror. Keep it ever before your eyes because God is faithful and he will bring that thing to pass. You all have a blessed week, amen.